On the morning of February 10, 1990, two armed men entered a Las Cruces, New Mexico bowling alley. They rounded up the two employees and two young girls that were already inside and forced them into the main office. Minutes later, another employee arrived with his two daughters, and they were also taken to the office. The gunman then shot all seven people multiple times and then set the office on fire before fleeing the bowling alley. Remarkably, three victims survived and later helped create detailed sketches of the two gunmen. But even with those sketches, the gunmen remain unidentified to this day. It's been more than 33 years since the La Cruces bowling alley massacre occurred, and investigators are still searching for the men responsible. Hey everyone, welcome back to Detective Perspective. My name is Derek Labasser. I'm a licensed private investigator and former police detective. Each week I'll be covering an unsolved case and story format. I'll then give you my perspective on the investigation and provide contact information for the individuals or organizations connected to the case so that if you have any tips, you can contact them directly and maybe you can help solve a case. And if you're someone who's interested in true crime, specifically unsolved cases, and you would like to hear my opinion on those investigations, please consider subscribing whether you're watching on YouTube or listening on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or whatever platform you use. I would greatly appreciate it. Okay, so let's get into tonight's episode, the Las Cruces Massacre. Um, this is a case that the mystery of it, yes, it's obviously there. Why am I covering it? Well, I think when you hear this story, and more specifically, hear one of the victims' 911 call, you're going to understand very quickly why I'm covering this case. Um, to not give too much away here, it was a 12-year-old girl who made this 911 call. Her name was Melissa. And I, I cried when I heard the call the first time. It, it was tough because I, I hear my daughters in that, in that call. It was just very difficult to listen to, and I, I want to warn you now for that. It's nothing graphic, but just hearing a little girl who has just been shot um, trying to keep herself together while she's still in so much pain and, and viewing other victims who have been shot at the same time and trying to relay information to the 911 dispatcher, it's, it's, it, it's, it's a tough one to get through. It's, it's only about four minutes, and I strongly recommend that you listen to it, but uh, if you decide to skip over it, I, I got to be honest, I wouldn't blame you. So that's my why for covering this case. There were multiple victims in this case. Some fortunately survived, uh, but the two men responsible for this, they've never been caught or at least never been held accountable for this crime. And it's it's been a long time since this crime occurred. And you may say, you know what, Derek, it's probably not going to get solved now. You may be right, but I can tell you this. Uh, at least it won't be for lack of effort, on our part at least. So when I read this case, when I started listening to the audio, looking at the photos, uh, I said to myself, we got to cover it. I had never heard of it before, and maybe most of you will have not heard of it either. So there could be someone from that area who knows something that you know, or it could just be about getting the message out there, getting more people to know about it, to hear about it, to listen to it. That's what we're doing here on Detective Perspective. So without wasting any more time, let's dive into the case. February 10th, 1990 was going to be a busy Saturday for Las Cruces Bowl, a family-owned and operated bowling alley located at 1201 East Amador Avenue in Las Cruces, New Mexico. The alley was scheduled to open at 9 a.m. with a youth bowling lead set to come in at that same time. The El Paso Times reported that around 40 children between the ages of 4 and 12 were expected to be there. To get everything prepared in time for the opening, multiple bowling alley employees showed up at least an hour early. The manager, 34-year-old Stephanie Senak, arrived around 8 a.m. She brought along her 12-year-old daughter, Melissa Repass, and Melissa's 13-year-old friend, Amy Hauser. They had plans to run the alley's daycare that day. Once they were all inside the bowling alley, Stephanie went into her office and started going over receipts from the night before while Melissa and Amy hung out. 
There was also one other employee in the building at that time, and that was 33-year-old cook Ida Ogin. Now, when Stephanie and the girls arrived, Ida was already in the kitchen, washing dishes and setting up for the day. At some point before 8.20 a.m., Melissa and Amy were on their way to the vending machines when they noticed two Hispanic men walking toward them. Melissa later recalled that one of the men was noticeably older than the other. The girls asked the men if they needed help, and instead of answering, they pulled out 22 caliber guns and ordered the girls into the office where Stephanie was still going through the receipts. The men forced the girls and Stephanie to get on the ground, and then one gunman briefly left to search the rest of the building. The other gunman found Ida in the kitchen where she was still getting ready for the day, and according to the Las Cruces Sun News, he pointed the gun at her and said, quote, Come with me, this is a holdup. He hit her on the back of the head with the gun multiple times and forced her into the office where Stephanie, Melissa, and Amy were sitting on the floor. Ida was told to get on the floor as well. One gunman ordered the victims to put their head down while the other instructed Stephanie to open the safe. Once the safe was open, the gunman took around $5,000 in cash, which was notably not all the cash inside the safe. Ida later told the police and the Associated Press that the gunman then started frantically going through the office cabinets as if they were looking for something else besides money. Now, while all of this was going on inside the office, 26-year-old Stephen Turan, the bowling alley's mechanic, arrived at work with his two daughters, 6-year-old Paula Ogin, who, by the way, was not related to Ida, and 2-year-old Valerie Turan. CNN reported that the gunman forced Stephen and his children into the crowded office as well, and then instructed everyone to kneel and put their heads on the ground. Then, the gunman shot the victims over and over again. Now, some sources claim that every victim was shot in the head. However, a captain from the Las Cruces Police Department has publicly stated five were shot in the head and the rest were hit in their shoulders, hands, and other body parts. Now, interesting enough, Ida told the police and the media that the gunman, quote, seemed nervous as they were shooting. They kept missing her and had to shoot her multiple times before successfully striking her. Now, for me, side note here, this is going to come into play later as far as talking about what some of the investigators who were or are involved in this case uh, think happened that day, or I guess I should say what type of criminals that they're dealing with here, what type of incident this was. Uh, I disagree with some of them. And this statement right here by Ida is the reason why. So I'll save it for the perspective. But remember what Ida said as far as these gunmen appearing to be nervous and more importantly, not being very accurate. Now, when the gunmen believed that all seven people were dead, they lit some papers on the desk on fire and then they escaped out the back door. And at 8.33 a.m., 12-year-old Melissa managed to pick up the office phone and dial 911. Yes, I need a fire engine too. 
Please help me. And two. Okay, Melissa. She said they locked them in the office. She doesn't know if they're still there or not. The door's open. There's a fire. It's on Amador, yes. Yeah. Please can you help. smell smoke, Melissa? Yes, I can see it. Okay. Can Melissa. I get the fire extinguisher? Fire department, too? Yes. She says she smells smoke. They may have lit the building on fire. No, it is on fire. It is on fire. It is. Okay, Melissa. Can I go Stand get the... by utility one. Oh, ow. Okay, Melissa, we've got them coming, hon. We've got them coming. If somebody oh, sorry, my mommy. Okay, Melissa, there's a police officer there now, okay? There is? Yes, there is. He's going to try and find you. We're in the office. Just tell me. I have 33 traffic. So we've got the ambulance coming. They're just down the street. Huh? She advises all seven are shot. They're injured. They're in the office. Where's the office at, Melissa? Right in the door, in the first desk, and then you take a right, and we're right in the building. Okay. She says you go in to the first desk, take a right, and they're right there at the office. Okay, I'm giving the directions on how to get to you, to the police officers that are there. Oh, my God. Please help me. We're helping you, Melissa. We've got them rolling. Okay? you got to be brave. got to be strong now. Okay? Oh, God. It's going to burn us right now. Okay. Can you see flames? Yeah. Okay. It's burning us. Okay. Oh, I got bullets in my feet. <laughs> okay. The oh. bullets in my head. You bullet the bullets in your head, too? <laughs> I hear the officers telling you to get out. Get I out. can't. There's nobody else. Was that the police officer telling yeah. you to get out? Yeah. Then get out. Okay. Okay? Mm -hmm. Now, a quick note here because I want to make sure we're accurate and that you guys have the right information. I know in that recording, Melissa referred to the gunman as black, suggesting they might be African-American. That, that doesn't appear to be the case. Detectives were quickly able to determine that the gunmen were most likely Hispanic, Cuban, or Cuban-American, not African-American. When first responders arrived, they immediately started trying to put the fire out while dragging the victims outside the office. That's when they realized Stephen, his daughter Paula, and Melissa's friend Amy were all dead. The rest of the victims were rushed to the hospital in critical condition, but 45 minutes later, Stephen's other daughter, Valerie, was pronounced dead. The only survivors were Melissa, Stephanie, and Ida. Police immediately started canvassing the area around the bowling alley, hoping to find people who had seen the gunman. They also spoke to Stephanie's brother, who I'm going to refer to as Blake. Blake told officers that he had gone to the bowling alley that morning to grab a backpack he had left the night before. As he headed into the building, he noticed the doors were unlocked. When he saw Stephanie, he mentioned this and reminded her to lock them until it was time to open. On his way out, Blake saw two Hispanic men walking around the back of the building to the front. One of the men was visibly older than the other. Blake said the older man gave a small case to the younger man and then squatted down and looked directly at Blake. Because of this interaction, Blake was able to get a really good look at the gunman and he later helped police put together composite sketches, which were almost immediately released to the public. The Associated Press reported that police had also spoke to witnesses who had seen two men driving a van or utility vehicle that was either tan or green and in the area around the time of the shooting. With a description of the gunmen and their vehicle, authorities set up 10 roadblocks on all highways leading out of Las Cruces. For the rest of the day, they screened all drivers coming in and out of the city. The Army, U.S. Customs, and Border Patrol also searched the area using helicopters and planes, hoping to identify the tan or green vehicle witnesses had mentioned earlier. However, they didn't find any vehicles matching those descriptions. Meanwhile, back at the bowling alley, the Las Cruces Police Department was processing the crime scene. Now, I want to stop here real quick and, and set, the, set the tone here because this is a difficult scene to process. First off, you have the fire. And I think it's it's very important to note that before detectives got there and started to process the crime scene, firefighters did show up and they used a water hose to put the fire out. So I can tell you right then and there, 
you're going to have a lot of contamination, a lot of destruction of evidence just from the fire and the water. Um, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't try, but could it make more issues with potential evidence like DNA or fingerprints, things of that nature, possible trace evidence involving hair? Yeah, you could, that evidence could literally be destroyed in the process of uh, trying to put out that fire, which again is no fault of anyone, but I can tell you that when we had arson investigations, uh, it was very difficult to find anything. That's why you had to bring the fire marshal and other experts in that area in. And usually we were looking for a different type of crime or maybe it was a insurance fraud, et cetera. So they were more so looking for what started the fire and a potential accelerant. This is a, a homicide investigation. And yeah, it's a little different, but I can tell you either way, it's going to make the investigator's job that much harder. Now, due to all the obstacles at the crime scene, Las Cruces police called in New Mexico State Police to help investigate. And according to Las Cruces Sun News, investigators were never able to find enough evidence at the scene to put together a DNA profile for the gunman. The main thing they were able to recover were fingerprints and shoe prints, but since the crime scene was a bowling alley, fingerprints and shoe prints were something you would expect to find everywhere. In the days and weeks after the massacre, police were able to speak with the survivors who were able to provide detailed descriptions of the two gunmen. They said the older gunman was around 50 years old with salt and pepper hair and a dark complexion. He was 5'7", 140 pounds, with a slight accent. The younger gunman was around 30 years old with dark wavy hair and light eyes. He was 5'10", 170 pounds, with no discernible accent, but it's important to note that both gunmen spoke fluent English and Spanish. And based on the information described by the witnesses, a composite sketch of each gunman was created and shared with the public. Soon, detectives were investigating more than 100 tips. Some people reported seeing two men looking for the interstate and running across Amador Avenue directly after the massacre. Others mentioned a gang living two streets away from the bowling alley who might have also been responsible. One tip was about a woman at a local bar who said she let the two gunmen stay with her. Now, when the police went to interview this woman, she seemed really high, so they were cautious about believing what she had to say at the time. The woman claimed the gunman killed everyone at the bowling alley for drugs, believing there was a big stash there. The gunman that hit at her place when they heard the helicopters looking for them. Now, here's the interesting part. The woman took a lie detector test and passed, but she later sobered up and recanted her story, claiming that she lied to look good to the people in the community and possibly get free drugs. Some of the more promising tips came from multiple witnesses who claimed to have seen the gunman in the bowling alley on the Friday night before the massacre. According to these witnesses, one of the gunmen tried to hit on Stephanie, but she turned him down. This obviously led some to theorize that maybe the shooting had been retribution for that occurrence. Now, I want to weigh in on this real quick because this story can absolutely be true in its entirety, and yet the intent on why the gunmen were there could be completely different, and it still may have nothing to do with why the shooting occurred later. That might have already been predetermined. What I mean by that is it's very possible that these witnesses did in fact see these two gunmen at the bowling alley a week prior, and it's also very possible that one of them might have hit on Stephanie and she might have turned him down, and he probably wasn't happy about it. But I would argue that more than likely their reasoning for being at the bowling alley was not to hit on women. It was to canvas the area, it was to scout the place, and it was to gather some intelligence on the establishment because they knew they were going to be robbing the place very soon. Now, after going through all the evidence and tips they had so far, detectives came up with a few theories. The massacre could have been a robbery gone wrong or a botched hit. But some felt like the robbery theory left a lot of questions unanswered. If it was really just a robbery, then why did the gunmen leave money in the safe? Why didn't they cover their faces? And why did they kill the kids? All of this led some detectives to lean more toward the theory that the massacre could have been a botched hit. But that still raised one big question. Why would anyone want a bowling alley employee dead? In hopes of answering this question, detectives met with Ron Senak the owner of the bowling alley, and the father of victim Stephanie Senak. The Albuquerque Journal reported that detectives asked Ron if the shooting could have been committed by someone who had a grudge against him, and Ron said no. He thought it was an armed robbery, with the only motive being money. 
According to him, the bowling alley had been robbed several times since opening in 1984. But when detectives interviewed Stephen Turan's brother, he mentioned that Ron's lifestyle was a little suspect at the time of the shooting. Ron lived in the bowling alley and had been visited by multiple strange people in the previous months. He had lost a lot of money on foolish ventures and was $1.5 million in debt. He was so far in debt that he had to reopen the bowling alley less than a week after the massacre occurred. Once Ron found out that police were looking into him, he became uncooperative with the investigation, which only made him look more suspicious. Ron later told the documentary, A Nightmare in Las Cruces, that he was uncooperative with police because they considered him a suspect. However, he claimed that he still went to the police station every day for updates. Now that's his side of the story. Detectives said that wasn't true. They always had to track Ron down whenever they wanted to speak with him. But I will, I will say this, in the end, detectives were never able to find any proof that Ron was connected to the massacre. And Ron wasn't the only person detectives were looking into. They also investigated another possible theory involving the Senac family. There was a rumor going around that one of Stephanie's brothers, RJ, who worked at the bowling alley, was dependent on cocaine and was conducting, quote, transactions at work. Detectives theorized that if RJ was buying drugs at the bowling alley, then maybe the gunman knew about it and had shown up to target him. Now, detectives did sit down with RJ to talk, and, and during that interview, he was blank-faced the entire time and did not volunteer any new information, answering only questions they asked him. And ultimately, detectives were unable to determine whether RJ was the target of the massacre or not. Furthermore, detectives were unable to prove the botched hit theory, the robbery gone wrong theory, or any other theory for that matter. Detectives spent the next 10 years doing everything they could possibly think of to solve this case. They investigated over a thousand suspects, they contacted psychics, they talked to hypnotists, and worked with multiple television shows. In March of 1990, Unsolved Mysteries traveled to Las Cruces to film a segment about the murders. After the episode aired, law enforcement received many tips, but none of them panned out, and in March of 1995, America's Most Wanted aired an episode about the massacre as well. Once again, tips flooded in, but nothing came of it. During this entire time, Ida, Stephanie, and Melissa were dealing with the unimaginable. Although they survived the shooting, things were far from over. Ida suffered panic and anxiety attacks, headaches, and PTSD, and her brain injuries made it difficult for her to do everyday things. Melissa and Stephanie both had PTSD as well, and Stephanie also had lasting physical injuries from the shooting. And unfortunately, Stephanie passed away in 1999 due to long-term complications from those injuries. As the investigation entered the 2000s, detectives continued following leads. In 2005, the sketches of the gunman were updated to account for 15 years of aging, but unfortunately, no significant leads came in. By the 2010s, detectives were still actively working the case, and in 2011, one detective told CNN that after reviewing thousands of leads, he believed the murders were the result of a robbery committed by experienced criminals who wanted to leave no witnesses. He said, quote, it was easy for them to kill, but you couple that with their knowledge of what they were going to gain out of hitting this particular place, and it tells you that this probably isn't their first crime. The detective also said that there was someone out there who knows what happened and they need to come forward so that the victims and their families can finally have answers. Now, speaking of the victims, Melissa, who was now in her 30s, told CNN that she needed the killers to be caught so she could finally stop living in fear. She said, quote, then I will be able to go out in public and feel safe. I won't constantly look over my shoulder. I won't feel for my children, for their safety. I won't fear. I won't have fear in my own home that they're going to come and try and finish what they tried to do 21 years ago. In 2016, the lead detective told the Las Cruces Sun News that he was frustrated the case hadn't been solved yet, but he promised the investigation was still active. He went on to say that evidence collected at the scene was routinely processed and analyzed, but a lot of the case was, quote, dependent on someone coming forward with information. Steve Turan's brother told the Sun News that he was also frustrated the case wasn't solved. He said, quote, in this day and age, things like this don't go unsolved. How did we not get these guys? That's the question I ask myself every day. Numerous people saw these gunmen, 
So someone out there knows something and they need to come forward. In 2020, 30 years had passed since the massacre and multiple detectives sat down with Sun News to discuss their theories on the case. One of the original detectives said they believed the gunmen were professionals due to the type of weapon they used, how the victims were shot, and how the gunmen tried to get rid of the evidence. He thought the shooting was possibly meant to send a message. This detective also said, quote, the shooters were initially thought to be from Las Cruces, but information later led us to believe they were from out of state and sent here to do a job. Another detective said she believes the men had help and that's why they were able to lay low in the community for some time after the massacre. Now, February 2022 marked the 32nd year since the massacre and the Las Cruces Police Department announced a $25,000 reward for information leading to the suspects. In addition to that, the creator of the documentary, A Nightmare in Las Cruces, Charles Min, also offered $7,000, bringing the total reward to $32,000. Unfortunately, those are the last updates we have in this case. The Las Cruces Police Department is still searching for the two men who shot Ida Ogin, Stephanie Senak, Melissa Repass, Amy Hauser, Stephen Turan, Paula Ogin, and Valerie Duran. All right, let's dive into my perspective. And this is going to be a quick one again, because I feel like a lot of what I'm going to say is, is speculation, but it's based on my experience and what my takeaway is after reading this story and after looking at any information that I've been able to find. Uh, for me, I feel like the investigators in this case, although their hearts are probably in the right place, it seems like based on whatever generation of investigator was working it, they all kind of have differing opinions. Um, although I will say there's probably some truth to each and every one of those theories as far as what really happened that day. Uh, for me, and again, I'll just qualify it, it it's, it's speculation for the, for the most part, but I am going off witness testimony and what we do know about this case. And if I were to take a shot at what happened this day or why it happened. I, I don't believe this was a robbery gone wrong. I don't believe this was a botched hit. I believe based on what we know from the witnesses that more than likely this was drug related. I feel like these individuals uh, were probably not from the area. And I say that because if they were locals, I think they would have been found. And the reason I think they would have been found is it's interesting what happens with a community, even amongst criminals of that community, when there are children who are victims. It feels like code, as far as snitches get stitches type thing, gets put aside when you have a child involved. And if these two individuals were known by people who live there, they would have ratted them out and we would have had them in custody and we wouldn't be covering this case today. So I do feel like they're from out of state. And I do feel like there's a potential that there was some drug activity uh, going through that bowling alley, whether it was th through an employee or through the owner. I don't know. And I'm not going to sit here and accuse anyone of something when I don't have the facts to do so. But based on what we've heard about the owner, Ron, I know that he was later, he was quote unquote uncooperative. If you, if you ask police, Obviously, he says he wasn't. You have to ask yourself, was he uncooperative because he was considered a suspect or was he uncooperative because the police were getting too close to his backstory and potentially the truth? I'll leave that up to you. Um, but for me, when you think about what Ida and others have said, other witnesses who were there, these individuals went in there, had Stephanie open the safe didn't even take all the money out of the safe before looking in other cabinets. So if there's money staring them right in the face, what the hell else would they be looking for in those cabinets? You tell me, what else could it be? Bowling balls? Pins? No, they're looking for something that you wouldn't expect to find at a bowling alley. And in my experience, especially as a narcotics detective, Usually when you find large amounts of money, you'll usually find some drugs as well. And there must have been an indication 
that there were large amounts of drugs in that particular location at certain periods of time. I, I don't, again, I don't know where they would get that information from, how they would learn that information, whether it was actually true or not. But these two guys, it sounds like they, they felt like there was going to be a stash of drugs inside there when they went in. And listen, that's just not completely speculation on my part. We have a witness who, depending on what you want to believe, has said in the past, which she later retracted, that these guys went in there for drugs. They thought there was going to be a big stash, and it wasn't there. They, they took whatever money they could get, and they got out of there. And I think that them burning the place down and shooting those witnesses was because they, they, they knew that if they left them alive, or they thought that if they left them alive, they would be exposed and they would be apprehended so they were trying to destroy evidence and any witnesses who could implicate them. That doesn't mean they're professionals. I would argue the exact opposite. Again, go back to what Ida was saying initially. They had to shoot her multiple times. They kept missing her. Does that sound like a professional hitman to you? No, nah, I don't think so. And just to go back to the aftermath where these gunmen shoot these seven victims, uh, police respond pretty quickly set up roadblocks. They got U.S. Customs involved. You got Border Patrol. You got helicopters. You got everybody looking for these guys. Nobody finds them, right? I also think there might be some truth to some other witness testimony that suggests, even by some of the detectives as well, that these guys, whether they were local or not, had help from members of the community. And instead of going on the run in this green or tan van, if that was even the vehicle they were in, didn't go very far, went to a, a specific location that they had already predetermined and they stayed there for a while and let the heat, you know, cool down before they decided to make any moves. And that could be that person they were staying with could also be the person that provided the information suggesting that there were large amounts of money and drugs inside this bowling alley, which leads me to my final thought here. We're could we potentially go from here? The only really thing left that can be done if it hasn't been done already, and I, I would assume that it has, you have to look as deep as you can into the owner and any of the employees that were working there to see what type of activity was occurring inside that bowling alley other than bowling. And if it's drugs, then it's drugs. We have to find out who they were dealing with, who they were discussing their, their extracurricular businesses with, and also who their competitors were in that surrounding community. Because, by the way, this doesn't have to be a friend. It could be a foe. And, again, it's a long shot 32 years later. I'm not going to lie. It's a, it's, a, it's a real long shot. But if there's an opportunity there and they haven't done it yet, that, that is an alternative that I would explore. Because more than likely that friend or foe relayed information to an outside source indicating that there was a large amount of drugs and, and, and money in this location at this particular time. There may have been associates from another community who came in knowing that they were less known by individuals around there and they carried out the act. They did what they did and then they went back to this house and stayed there for a few days, maybe a few weeks before they went on and went back to wherever they came from. But either way, where we sit today, I agree with what the detective said at the last part there that there's a lot of people, I, I would think a handful at least, that know what happened that day and know the people responsible. Uh, and for all we know, the individuals that carried out this assault, they could be in prison on unrelated crimes. I mean, if there's someone, if they're doing things like this, more than likely they didn't stop after this. So they're probably in our system. These guys are probably known to the law enforcement community. And this isn't the only case where that happens. There are a lot of people who are in prison right now for certain crimes and they have never been connected to even more heinous crimes that they were involved in. That's just the reality of the situation. So what can we do? We're going to talk about the case. We're going to discuss it amongst our friends and family. We're going to get as much exposure out there as we can in the hopes that someone who does know what happened that day finally comes forward, finally decides to speak up, whether it's to me or law enforcement or a news outlet, whatever it might be that finally says, listen, it was that recording that I heard from Melissa that finally put me over the edge. I can't deal with it anymore. I have to say something. Remember, guys, you can remain anonymous. If you know something, I would rather you come forward and just 
do it under a pseudonym, whatever you have to do, but at least provide the information that may put investigators on the right track. And my final words tonight go to Melissa. I, I don't know if she's going to hear or, or see this episode, but I'm hoping someone who knows her does. And I just want her to know that we're thinking of her. And I'm, I'm glad to see, I know it's not without its shortcomings and complications, but I'm glad to see that she has children of her own now. And I, I just want to reiterate, I said at the top of the show, uh, listening to her in that audio recording as a 12 year old to stay that composed and have that much courage to do what she was doing. Even at one point saying, do I need to go grab a fire extinguisher? This is a 12 year old girl, just unbelievably impressed by her. And to continue on with your life and do what you're doing now, I continue to be impressed. And I want you to know that you don't have to live in fear, that you have people around you that you don't even know uh, that are all supporting you now. And we're here for you. And uh, we're hoping that one day when we talk about this case again, it'll be to update everyone that the people responsible for what they did to you and the people that were there at that bowling alley that day have been held responsible for what they did and are now going to serve the rest of their lives in prison. Uh, that is the ultimate hope for us, and that is our ultimate hope for you. And to everyone watching or listening out there, if you have any information about this case, you should call the Las Cruces Crime Stoppers at 1-800-222-8477 or go to nmcrimestoppers.org. Just remember, there is a reward. I want to thank you guys all for being here tonight. Stay safe out there, and I'll see you soon. Mm -hmm.